how and where we live. Uh, we're going to be discussing um, how housing might fit into the city's comprehensive plan. So now, uh, I'm Tim Love. Uh, I'm an architect and urban designer. Uh, I'm the BSA president this year, and we're convening, or, or, or not hosting, but convening uh, the conference. Um, and my focus on housing is through a couple of lenses. One is that I'm uh, the director of the graduate program at Northeastern and coordinate the housing studio there. So we're graduating housing experts every year. And then my firm, Util, uh, uh, designs housing projects both for CDCs and for uh, uh, for-profit developers. So we see both sides of the supply chain, I guess. <coughs> so I, I, I think with that, um, we were invited each to if, if we wanted to, to give a little six minute talk. And I know that, uh, we'll get right to it, uh, Katie actually brought a short slide presentation, so that's what we're gonna do next. Okay. Uh, I'll start with Katie. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, well I did, you know, whatever. I, I, I always talk in images and slides, so, um, so that idea. was a good way for me to just kind of organize myself, I guess, this you? morning. Um, that one, yeah. So I, I just really wanted to start out with this essential call that John Barrow started with yesterday. I mean, he asked the four panelists, how do we design a city that's based on the premise of social equity? And nobody answered, of course, because in fact, we don't know really the answer for this. This is all kind of a work in progress. And so um, I guess I'm not going to say that I have the answer for this, but I do think that um, that it should be one of our central themes. I think that as the planning process gets undertaken, that we understand that this is, as people have said, this is not about land planning. You know, we have to look outside the fields of architecture, the fields of community development, the fields of planning, and look to other fields as well. We need to engage with public health practitioners. We need to engage with uh, entrepreneurship. We need to take on some of these issues a little bit more squarely. Um, we, had, we held a conference here in Boston. John Barros came, the mayor spoke, some of you were there. The Bar Foundation was one of our key supporters in that. And we had a, a conference called Design for Equity. This was kind of our logo for that. Um, we convened it with the Bruner Foundation, the Loeb Fellowship as well. And coming out of that, we had a lot of different questions. So a group of um, seven of my female colleagues and I who work across the country in very different organizations sort of came together and just finished, in fact, today is the final blog post in this series that we call Design for Equity. And um, this is not a comprehensive list, but this is some of the issues that we've taken on in our blog. And I'd encourage you to go read it. Um, and I can say that because I wrote you know, part of the first and part of the last, but really brilliant people really digging in to think about these questions. Um, and some of them, you know, I'm not going to go through all of these today, but some of these issues are things that we cannot back away from and that the tools of planning do not necessarily give us a, a full enough vocabulary to be able to take on the kind of issues of um, diversity and equity that we have in our cities today. So, um, you know, one of these posts, the second one, gets in, it's not just the definition, it kind of gets into, so what does this mean for us as we think this through? So again, a quick introduction. Yesterday I was really pleased that Michael Murphy and, um, his, and one of his colleagues, Chris, stood up and said, what about next generation leadership? I think this question is essential. What I heard yesterday was a sense that there's a continuation. And I would like to suggest that it's time for a disruption in the city. And that part of that disruption is not just in terms of accommodating social spaces for young people or um, affordable micro units, love those, but it's not just about the physical planning. It's actually about how do you, how do you catalyze those ideas? We've done a lot of work in this area. We're no, by no means um, you know, the, the expert in this, but one of the programs that we've been so lucky to run is the Rose Fellowship Program. And I do want to say for those of you in the room who um, are interested in this, we have a call out right now for applicants um, for next year. And you know what we're finding is that the role between architecture and community development, there's a big gap in the middle. And that there's a need for sort of a creative design process to be able to really do the community engagement that can kind of knit these, these groups together. 
But so in the process of this, I mentioned that, you know, I've been around the country, and if you saw that map, um, together this group has helped build 10,000 units of affordable housing. And what I would say about this is that, you know, what we're trying to do is really learn how that housing is not just housing, right? We need housing, but it all has to do much more. So one of the essays is around this question about outcomes-based design, and I think that's the thing that I wanted to focus on a little bit today. That when we're looking at, this is a project in San Francisco we did, um, designed by David Baker. It's a beautiful project across from City Hall for chronically homeless people. But every move that we make has to have multiple effects, right? It can't just be a beautiful building. It can't just be a sustainable building. We have to understand how it's positively impacting the economics of the city, the economics of the state. We have to understand how is a building like this fundamentally changing a person's life and their ability to contribute in a very different way. So whatever your question is, is it, um, whoops, oh, it looks like I have a wrong slide in there. So I'll skip over that one. So I think that in part, one of the things I heard yesterday was very much around urban planning and architecture. And I think those tools are just simply not enough for us anymore. Um, it was sort of shockingly little about environment, which I know we all are 100% focused on. So I don't think we have to worry about that quite as much. But what about the sort of health outcomes? In some ways, I've said to people, health is the new green. It's going to be our new metric for, in some ways, measuring success. But the social dynamics are some of the ones that we know the most in our own lives and in the lives of our neighborhoods, but we know the least how to plan for and predict. Um, this is a project we've been working on, Lathrop Homes in Chicago. It's a Chicago Housing Authority project. You see it actually had this beautiful Jens Jensen plan um, for the landscape. Buildings need um, certainly quite a lot of work, not very dense. 900 units, going to really densify. But some of these questions about how do we start to look at what are the outcomes that we seek? These may not be the outcomes that Boston seeks for this project. These were the outcomes that they seek. So the question is not just what's the best urban plan. The question is what are the outcomes that we seek as a result of the planning and design? And how are we going to understand how to create a process where the decisions we make throughout the community planning process and throughout the process of making those design decisions may actually leverage up into these outcomes. And that potentially then after that, you're, you're able to sort of do a sense of measuring what your success rate was. So fortunately, um, you know, the environmental field has found a way to, in, to sort of evaluate um, you know, success through LEED and our Green Communities Program and Enterprise. The public health field has a lot to offer us in this, I believe. So I think, again, this is not just about architecture and planning. And part of it is that also, I just have to say, the architecture profession as a whole is not representative of the communities that we seek to serve. And just by a lens of women in design, 20%, um, 18% women in architecture right now. This was a study that was just done called the missing 32%. Um, the idea is that in school, women are 50-50, and then by the time they get into the profession, 32% of that drops off, and it becomes 1882, okay? Secondly, there are, I don't know the stats about um, non-white in the whole profession, but there are one and a half percent of architects are black women. So by definition, how could we possibly look only to that profession for our guidance? It makes no sense that we're never going to get the kind of input that we need. So my last slide is just a call for you to join me with the NEA um, on May 13th. We're hosting a conversation, which I've called We Are Not Missing, because in many ways, I would be one of these people who would be missing from the profession of architecture because I've focused my career on community development rather than architecture sort of within a firm. And so I invite us to diversify the profession for sure to make it better, but to not only rely on it as we go forward. Quick question, is that you use the same scorecard for all of your projects, the, the, the list that you have? We're, we're working on that. 
we're working on that, and we don't know yet. We're doing a um, sort of design studio in house right now, um, where we're testing out this idea. Um, so we're developing this. You all know uh, John Dalzell um, worked closely with Brian Phillips from ISA Architects. They just won um, a National AIA Award for their great project in Roxbury, right? The four uh, net zero homes. Um, he partners with a woman named Rupal Sangeev, who has a group called Health by Design, and she's a public health practitioner. So we've set up a sort of starting framework, and right now, through three of our fellows, we're um, investigating how to apply this at the scale of their neighborhood in Oakland, um, Minneapolis, and, um, and Boston, actually, uh, in Brighton. And then also, we're going to also be looking, we do a lot of tribal work, and we're going to be working with the Santa Domingo Housing Authority. Well, just pivoting from your story to the issue at hand, I think one thing for the city to consider is a um, even having a discussion about what the scorecard should be even before you fill in the dots itself is a public conversation, because it has to do with categories of taxonomy and priorities. So I. I, I'm kind of the takeaway person maybe on the panel today, and I, I think that it's a pretty good draft of what one of these things might look like. So um, maybe Sheila, do you want to go next? Um, so <coughs> before, you, before you launch your Could questions. Could I ask a quick question? Yeah. Just, is that going to be streamed as the Women in Design? If you, I don't know where it is. And yeah, the NEA is hosting a, uh, a larger conversation on social impact design. And, um, and in Washington? <coughs> Uh, yeah, it'll be live stream though. It's um, May 13th. You can log on through the NEA site. Um, and then there's another one on education and social impact design that one of my colleagues, Barbara Brown Wilson, will be convening in June. Katie was on the NEA. Once, and she's awesome, by the way. So I just need a little plug. <laughs> I hire good architects. <laughs> So she was going to say a few things. Just a, just a couple of things. And I, I always appreciate Katie because she's making us think, you know, one or two or three steps beyond just need. And, and I, I sort of approach things um, maybe to a fault, just looking at need. So as we start to plan for the city, what, what, is, what do we need? And, and many of you know we put out a housing plan in October. We're starting to implement it. It's not the end of the conversation. In fact, just it, it really defines what Boston's going to need between now and 2030 as far as numbers and who's living here and demographic shifts. But it, it, there's a lot of unanswered questions about how we're going to meet some of those, some of those um, goals that we've set forth. So just context for 15 seconds, and then we'll, I'll pass on. Uh, so Boston's growing, which is terrific. We all know that. We expect 90,000 additional residents by the time of 2030. I think those estimates might even be low uh, based on sort of what we're seeing in the last couple of years. Um, we've determined with the help of many that we need to build about 53,000 units. You've heard that number. That's because households have become very small. We have a growing elderly population. It's going to grow by 23,000 people as boomers age. That's a, it's a, it's a very big um, issue for us because elders used to you know do this exodus they're not anymore they're staying they're they're here to stay which is good which is good um, we have a lot of people a lot of people um, that can't pay the rent and eat and pay for other things we right now have about 28,000 households low-income households in the city of Boston that are rent burdened we're anticipating another 10,000 to come so about 30,000, 40,000 households that are low income that are struggling to pay rent. That is a staggering number. So with all of that need as background, and I don't want to depress anyone, I just some of the, there is some challenges out there. There's some great things happening, but there are some challenges. Resources to build affordable housing, or on the, especially from the federal government, are, is decreasing. Costs are at an all-time high for the architects and developers in the room. You know this. Uh, never seen numbers, never seen numbers like this in my life. Boston's a pretty built city, uh, and we, so we have to find new opportunities and encourage the right kind of density while looking at many of the other issues that Katie has uh, highlighted. And I think we've been doing the same thing for a very long period of time. And uh, it's served us well in some areas. You know, we have the highest percentage of affordable housing in the country uh, compared to other cities. Um, 
it's a nice city, it's a livable city, it's a walkable city. So we're doing some very good things here, but we have been doing the same thing for a very long period of time. So I think if we're going to meet these goals, we have actually really have to think anew. So I'll stop there. One of the, one of the things that links both of your talks is the importance that the data, um, whether it's around outcomes or, or looking more closely at the data that you're talking about, um, is more possible now, uh, both mm -hmm. in terms of strategy um, and even the longer implementation game, game plan. That, that, that things are more measurable now than they've ever been to help prioritize different policies. Um, Glenn, do you want to sure. say a few things? Yeah. Um, I, I was going to start maybe by personalizing a little bit. Um, you know, I'm actually second generation Bostonian. My, my folks grew up uh, in the community. And uh, I actually grew up in Sharon. Someone mentioned Sharon earlier. And, mm -hmm. uh, but my grand folks were here in, in the Roxbury, Dorchester area, and I graduated BU and came back uh, to the community. And, um, and t today, I, I actually currently li live in Roxbury, work in Roxbury, and uh, was living in Dorchester just prior to that. And so, and I, I, I actually want to start in as um, kind of my identity as a parent. I'm a, um, I'm a single dad half the week, and I have a nine-year-old child. Um, and it's interesting, she was in Newton Public Schools, uh, folks were talking about, Harry talked about schools earlier, up until about third grade, and then we had, her mother moved out of Newton, and I had to figure out what to do. And it turns out that um, there was a neat little um, uh, elementary school down the street from us. And I just want to put a, a plug in for BPS, Boston Public Schools. And she's, uh, yeah, exactly, actually, absolutely. And she, for the last couple of years, she's been at the Nathan Hale Elementary School. And I gotta tell you, it was a great fit for her. And she's blossomed academically over the last couple of years. Um, the challenge is what happens after she gets out of fifth grade. Right. Fo fo folks and parents, parents in Boston know that's a big issue. And, and here we sit, right? And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the honest truth. We're looking at private school, right? And so as a Boston resident, right, who's, you know, not, you know, I do okay, but that's a big deal, right, to figure out how do you, how do you deal with this issue where now we have to send our kid, you know, out of, out of the neighborhood uh, for their education. Um, so these are just one of some of the, the challenges, you know, that, we, that we're all facing. Um, I'll just quickly say a couple of little stories um, that I think has some themes, and the theme really is, it's, to me, it's about kind of this grassroots, bottom-up approach to the solutions. And I'll start with my company. I know being a local resident um, uh, for the last 20 years, it's 20 years ago, and it was me and a couple of other local, uh, a couple of local guys that started this thing. And it's been a long journey, right, to start a company, be successful. And part of the philosophy was to have it, you know, kind of locally owned and run and managed. So we try to stay true to that mission as we've grown this company, remain profitable, but also do things beyond just being a kind of a, you know, conventional company, like looking at where we buy our product from, you know, helping the local food system, su um, supporting other black businesses uh, in terms of how we purchase. And I'm happy to say, you know, the quick, the quick, um, Summary of that is, 20 years later, you know, we'll, we'll do nine million in sales. We have 100 employees. You know, you know, uh, well-paid folks, and uh, so you know. But to, to do something like that, the the challenge is, and that what we found is that there's not enough examples of that. You know, in our urban communities, and even Boston. When you look around, you look at black-owned, you know, uh, you know, companies of serious scale. It's actually just very discouraging, and so that's a that's a challenge. And, so more recently, I've shifted over to how to help fill that gap and how to support, you know, really strengthening ecosystem of building a, a stronger entrepreneurs so we can actually deal with this equity issue. Because I think, you know, small business is part of that issue around job creation and wealth creation. Um, and my other little, little quick story is, um, is around urban farming. And I'll just, I'll just say quickly, uh, the city's been great uh, to deal with. Uh, I think Boston is uh, one of the pioneering cities around urban farming across the nation. And it started, one of the origin stories, I don't talk about this too much, is we literally squatted some land in the city. And we said, you know what, we're just gonna, we're just gonna get it started. You're, you're gonna react to us. And, uh, and, and the city did. We call that moral site control. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, hey, listen, after the, this morning session, I feel I can speak freely in this group. It sounds like <laughs> we're just gonna have, we're gonna have a little session this morning. But, uh, so, we, so we got on the land and basically, um, and, and the whole philosophy was, can we create sustainable urban farms? And that's a whole other conversation. We're still figuring that out. Um, but uh, I'm happy to say that last year, and actually the city did a really great, they had an amazing process. We changed the laws of Boston. So it actually became legal, you know, as a zoning amendment, that you actually you could sell uh, crop. 
you know, in an urban setting. We couldn't do that initially. And so, um, and then watch that process as a whole, a whole other workshop. But it really was a blend of city, community, uh, residential input, farming input. And, uh, and, and so it was, it was really interesting to watch. Um, but again, I put that up there because it started really from the, from the community demand and need. And saying, we're gonna, we're gonna start this process and really, and then they're going to work together to make sure you know, we, we create something that actually makes sense for, for all parties. And I'm just happy to announce that actually this past week, four local farmers are about to take over my share in this, in this, in this farming entity. So it's going to be local residents who are, will continue to move this thing forward, which is part of, of how, how I operate. I'll just quickly say, around the local food system, we have all these different assets in our community, like the Crop Circle Kitchen, uh, like the, the online, the Boston Public Market. Uh, huge demand for fresh and local. So part of my thing is food, and how do we kind of pull these assets together to really create local jobs, local wealth? And we're in the beginning stage of how that, how that works, and it's, and it's an exciting, to, exciting to watch. Um, and there's a term I actually I wrote down this morning as I was listening, and it's, it's um, I call it the community entrepre entrepreneur activist, right? I think that's what I am, and I see a lot of them out there. And I'll give you one example. A young woman in Dorchester, about two or three years ago, created a uh, lead platinum three-family uh, uh, house in Dorchester, and her and her fiance at the time. And, they, and she had young, no experience in development, and, uh, and some of us in the room know her, put it up and did it at you know, below cost. They're living there. Uh, I think they're net, net zoo, whatever the terminology is, right? They're not putting any uh, carbon into, this, into, the, into the atmosphere. And, I, and so, and she just got her law degree recently, and I've been talking with her. I said, look at, I said, you are the new leadership that we're talking about. How do we get behind you to expand what you've done here uh, and, be, and be the kind of part of the new green development team, I call it, right? So we're having conversations around this issue around, you know, green, affordable co-housing, right? And how do we really do some unique stuff here in Boston led by the folks who, who have practical experience and, and can do these things? And I would challenge this audience and this group is how do we take the more conventional resources are at the table, which is a lot of you around this room, and support this, this new energy in a, in, a, in a practical way so that we actually really have the folks who, who are living in these communities not only benefiting, but really leading the charge. You know, as, as Harry said earlier, you know, at the table, but really leading the charge. So I'll, I'll, I'll end with that and we'll look forward to a good conversation. Okay, I, Crystal, do you, do you um, have a story to tell today? <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> I, I will spend a, just a few minutes commenting on some things I've heard. Um, so being in the public sector is an entirely new role for me and creates an entirely new lens for me that I'm sort of like, I feel like I got new glasses, like I'm sort of figuring out how things look different now that I'm on this side of the table. Um, and I'll say uh, one thing is when Katie puts this thing up, immediately my mind goes to every dot costs an extra dollar. <laughs> right? I was just like, oh my God, like how are we going to pay for this? <laughs> so sort of like Sheila's talking about she looks at it from need, I sort of am now looking at it from cost. Right? right? And so how do we, and given that costs are now <coughs> highest than they've ever been, how do we think about uh, designing structures in such a way that they are really cost effective, right? And how do we think about it in a way that they are um, sort of generational, right? We all talk about the triple decker. Well, it's been around for so long and served so many waves of people because, you know, it was built in that way. And I feel like we have to think now not about not just about the people who are here today or the people who are going to be here in a decade, but how are we building for people who are going to be here 50 years from now? Because, you know, one thing I learned, um, as many of you know, Urban Edge has been very involved in um, redeveloping Jackson Square. And one thing I learned was that, you know, it should take a long time to plan because it's going to be around for a long time. And so we should really do everything we can to get voices in and make sure that people are involved. But the flip side of that is that what happens is, is that when you have local folks driving, then they're really, you know, Boston is really kind of parochial in a lot of ways. And so people are driving design and planning for people who live like they do 
and you know think like they do. And the idea of design, of planning, of urban planning, is for people who don't live there yet, right? And so, how are we incorporating leadership from the public sector into that voice? That's um, you know, we want to be community driven, and how do you find the right balance between that, right? Because at the end of the day, people on the ground, in my experience, is like what they're really afraid of is change, right? Like. It's better to have that broken lot down there with the glass and the crack dealer, because that's what I know, because otherwise I don't know who's coming in here. And you know, and I want to fight about that and let's save that one bird, right? <laughs> Everybody's had that project, it's like, it's an endangered species. It's like, who gives a shit? It's a pigeon. <laughs> and so how are we as 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 public leadership serving that balance and having that voice for people who don't live here yet, but, but, and for a city that's balanced. But, but Glenn's story about this couple that, that were kind of grassroots developers, there, there's an idea about a kind of a talent search, about people who, have, who are entrepreneurial in the neighborhoods, who've done it themselves, who we find as part of this process, so they, they can tell that story to other people in their community. So it's, a, it's kind of the combo Glenn Katie story. I'm just trying to say, I'm just yeah. trying to say there's a balance. That's good, right. but in some, but you also get voices, and in fact, what happens, quite frankly, in my limited experience, is the process wears out the talent people. Mm -hmm. Because the process is, somebody described community process in Boston as a contact sport. <laughs> and it's like, the process wears out people who just want to come and get good, good ideas on the table and get something done. And so we've, as public leadership, we've got to figure out a process that figures out how to balance those two things so that we're giving voice to people who don't live there, people who do and have creative ideas, as well as people who are just loud and burly. <laughs> so, um, and then the other thing that I see when I think about this is um, if we're going to build to these different kinds of outcomes, then Sheila and I and our counterparts and our bosses have to figure out how we get money from these different sectors to go into developing these outcomes. And so there's money around town. And if we're building to get to environmental outcomes because we all think it's good, that shouldn't just come out of me and Sheila's pocket, right? Like, we got to figure out how to do that because we can't. Otherwise, we can't, and we're stuck doing the same thing we've been doing because we don't really have any new tools. And so those well, are the things exciting, that... Well, that's exciting, Crystal, because, I mean, this is such an incredible medical health community. And I know um, at Enterprise, but lots of people are working on pay-for-success models with, with health outcomes. Um, we have Megan Sandal, who's a, phys a pediatrician here in Boston, is on our board, and she says that children come into her practice and she wants to write them a prescription for a healthy house. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you do that? So I think you're absolutely right that we can't say the, the health piece has to come out of your budgets, but rather understanding that housing is not just housing, right? It's sort of like this platform right. for health and, and wealth and everything else. But yeah. this, is, this is also a template for the market, too. It's not just, I mean, just to be clear. Oh, yeah, no, I, I agree. I understand the lens you're looking at this through, but, um, but, but this has other political value that even points back to the community process, too. So it's not, I mean, I, I, I think shining a light on the cost of these things is awesome and it's right, but um, th there's other political value to um, getting a scorecard, at first everybody agrees to, to, to even look at projects that the market's trying to create. Yep. So, um, Well, and the issues that are trying to be captured by a card like this are so vast, they're almost overwhelming. Right. Right? I mean, it's like, how do you deal with all these things? How do we balance needs versus wants and affordability versus, you know, all these other things? And if nothing else, having something like this kind of gives you the ability to simplify it. If nothing else, you can say, this is what my project or what I'm proposing to do, what its impact is. You know, you can help understand what you're doing. Um, and I think it's got a lot of You can redirect a community meeting about a project. You know, you start, let, let's all score together, and so suddenly the conversation might change, maybe. Mm -hmm. 
I'm a little war torn about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's fair, right, Harry? <laughs> They've never been to a community meeting in JP. <laughs> Kelly, do you want to say anything else before we get to our provocative questions? Well, we've been kind of all across the board here, so I'm a, uh, a little overwhelmed myself. I would say that, um, you know, like Katie, um, I have the privilege of working in many cities, um, and and I think that your perspective of the city of Boston is very true. I think it's a great city. It has uh, a wealth of attributes that make it a great city, and it has a wealth of attributes that um, give it the potential to continue to be a great city. Um, and that's why we're here and why we're investing our money. Um, I think, you know, you sit there and you listen to, like the needs that Sheila describes, and they're very real and they're very over overwhelming. Uh, they're also very similar to what most big cities are going through, you know, and there's, everybody's trying to grapple with, you know, how do we deal with this and, you know, how are we going to supply enough units to create, hopefully, a sense of affordability and balance in the marketplace um, and balance that with what that means for increased density and what that means for the neighborhoods. And so um, they're very common themes and I, no more than anybody else, have any, you know, real good answers, um, but I do agree that it's, I think design and planning are kind of the foundation for what will kind of hopefully, you know, create the best result. But I agree that it goes well beyond that. I think that you know, kind of everybody who's involved um, on a from the physical kind of built world to the social entities to you know how are we you know even food. I think urban farming is is a tremendous example of a of a piece that is a very basic need for people's lives that has to be part of the process. You know, the education, kind of everything that everybody's been talking about. Um, in cost, uh, I'll mention that, because uh, it's come up a couple times. Um, many cities are going through the same kind of problem with cost increases, and we're talking construction cost, or cost basically to, to construct real estate, right? To buy land, land values are, are soaring, construction costs are rising, um, and it's, it's kind of the one part of the puzzle that most people feel like they can't control. Like we can go through planning process and we can talk about where we're gonna put density, we can talk about where transit lines go and where we're gonna encourage more density or less density. How do we control cost? It seems like this thing that's just unmanageable. And to me, um, I think of cost and construction in the same way that I think, Sheila, you think of cost in the cost of housing, it's supply. And if you look around the city, most of the workforce is operating at pretty close to full capacity, right? And I think that it's easy for people to kind of talk about um, unions or wages and things like that. And I think that's a little misguided because I think that the workforce that's out there, it's, it's a great workforce. And again, I, you know, we build on a lot of cities and I can tell you, you have a really great workforce within the construction trades. Um, they need to, we need to help the <coughs> trades kind of build their supply. They need to build their workforce for the future. It's not, part of it is educating that, the new generation of workers to build these buildings, these new buildings that, you know, the design world's gonna help create, um, but also just increasing the supply of those people. It's like kind of attracting, recruiting people into those trades will help alleviate some of the problem. And I think by the same token, trying to increase the pool of the companies that are providing those services will also be, you know, something that would be key to kind of help relieve some of the pressure of cost. Otherwise, we go through the same cycles that we always have been, which is we'll build and we'll build and we'll build, and it will only be through a recession that we'll see the kind of release valve on the on cost. Okay. One thing I, I think I want to—I heard you say in, that we're at capacity. I think in certain parts of the neighborhoods, I think—I mean. I, I, if you look at unemployment, especially among you know young African males, I mean, so I think there's a, there's a there's an opportunity, a talent opportunity, absolutely, I clearly. Yeah. But for, for folks need to be trained, prepared to roll in that pipeline so they could be effective in, in, in filling some of that gap. But just. So, uh, Sheila and I had a, a conference call to figure out how to get a good conversation going between us because we're quite diverse, and we came up with four provocative questions. They're actually not that provocative, they're actually softball questions, but, <laughs> but, they, um, but, but by labeling them as provocative, maybe the conversation will be uh, interesting. So um, the first question, um, and people can jump on this or we'll have to sign somebody, if you were in charge, whatever that means, uh, what would be the first step you would take to solve Boston's housing challenges? 
And Sheila, you can't answer because you are in charge. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> but, but Sheila wants to know the answer. I do want to know the answer. <laughs> Kelly? <laughs> uh, I don't know that I uh, have a, a good answer, but I, um, I'm learning about this grant that the city got for the Housing Innovation Lab, and I think, or I'm hopeful that that can be a, a good mechanism to kind of help bring all of these conversations and all of these issues together in a kind of structured sense that has a very specific kind of end goal of actually creating something that can happen. Um, so I, you know, I look at that and I'm learning more about it, but I, I, I look at that as kind of a place of hope for is, kind of bringing this together. Is that also bringing construction companies and labor together too? I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vehicle that you can get people together that, that maybe naturally are more adversarial. Is that, is that part of the logic of it? The, I, I, can, I think I can answer that. The mayor very much wants construction trades in the conversation and work. Right. He's very focused on that. Right. Uh, Katie, you probably have a better, uh, like a really good answer for this. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Um, I don't know. I might put Aisha in charge to start. Um, she's got her hand up. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that would be awesome. I guess I'd hire Sheila Dillon, no, and then um, <laughs> I feel like, um, yeah, solving Boston's housing challenges. I mean, I guess, um, I mean, I think part of the things that we've been discussing is that um, it is absolutely about housing and it's not only about housing. So I think this kind of larger view, I mean, I, I think this, this whole conversation about workforce development and listen, we've done a lot of work around, we used to call it lowering the cost of housing. Then we called it bending the cost curve um, we worked with the state of Minnesota where the Minnesota State Housing Finance Agency head, Mary Tingerthal, put out to her community, how are we going to lower the cost of affordable housing in our city and, or in our, in our state and called for innovative proposals and frankly most of them had to do with the soft costs, not the hard costs. Because the affordable housing delivery system of which I am a part and my company is a big part is so fundamentally cumbersome and flawed that it costs, your, a lot of the money in, in the house is not in the house, right? right. So, um, so I mean, I, I think that um, to have a sort of fresh look around housing is to have sort of a fresh look about what are the resources that we can generate. I mean, I think, you know, unions can be seen as a problem because of the high cost of labor, but we want to grow our workforce with as equal enthusiasm and diversify our workforce as we can. So um, I think some of the current structures that we have around the development of affordable housing, around the planning process, around the very cumbersome permitting and all these processes are really getting in the way. So I would look to one project which is a beacon, I would say, of a new way. And it's the Via Verde uh, project in New York Ross, City. Yeah. And, you know, it started about in 2003, actually, one of our Rose Fellows, Tara Siegel, helped, she co chaired a competition and led a community engagement process in the South Bronx. The community members in the South Bronx in 2003 said the primary goal for them in their neighborhood was health. This was before this was kind of au courant, right? It had to be about food, it had to be about health because they had the, some of the harshest health statistics in the country. Where your zip code is determines your longevity. So the city of New York did a competition. Um, it was an invited competition with developers and, and architects. And um, the key to it though was the writing of the, you know, writing the brief. Right, making sure that the brief was um, was open to innovation and and had its goals not on housing, but on health impacts and on neighborhood wealth and on the outcomes that we seek. Um, but the big thing that the city did, so they got their proposals, they chose their developer, and then the city got out of the way. In fact, they organized themselves. 
they had representatives from each department of the city on a streamlined panel whose goal was not to prevent or recheck or ask more questions or say no. Their goal was to see how were they collectively going to push forward this project, which, which is, an em is an emblematic of the highest quality design I've seen. And when I go to Via Verde now, you walk in, it's in the South Bronx, which is changing dramatically. You walk into this space, and I, I visit a lot of housing projects, right? Housing. You feel like you're like in this beautiful place. You know, you're in a beautiful place. The views are incredible. The kind of space that the buildings create is the kind of place you want to live, absolutely. And it's a combination of market rate for sale, it's affordable housing. So I think we can do it. But it, it, it was an expensive process, but um, I know the first time's always expensive. You but, know? It, but it was foundation money replacing. I mean, it 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 was a fancy process with a lot of public relations around it, which which had its own cost component as a model project. But yeah. I guess my question would be. Uh, so get the, the city out of the way. Let's forget. Okay. Let's forget right. some of the bells and whistles. <laughs> <laughs> Right. No, no, but I mean, we need the city, right? right. We need the city right. to be able to make these processes work. But which parts of the city processes are helpful and which parts are cumbersome? Right. And let's get right. organized around the helpful ones right. and facilitate best practices. The city got out of the way, though, because it had a mission force field around it. If it was just, you know, I, I think that we need to not think that um, the city should get out of the way always. Sometimes the city's interventions are useful for the greater public good. So in the case of a, a, a process like that about health, yeah. about equity, you know, the, the thing came glowing with virtues, so it was easy for the city to step away. So I just... Well, it took leadership. <laughs> Sean Donovan right. was right. the head of... Um, Sean Donovan, who then became the head of HUD, Secretary of HUD, was at the time the leader of housing and preservation in New York, and now he's in the Office of, of Budget and Management. He's a star. But, great. But we have those kind of voices here, too. And so I think leadership right. is different maybe than getting out of the way. That's right. Okay, I shouldn't say getting out of the way. I should say leadership mm -hmm. and the right kind of leadership. Right. So we have some more questions. Anyone want, want to tackle being in charge? Crystal, is that interesting? She is in charge. It's, not, it's overrated. <laughs> I would say um, I'm more simple. I think that it's a numbers game, and we've got to think and talk differently about density. Yeah. And so you're not, I mean, you're not going to, you can't deal with these numbers yeah. with, with, you know, with the kind of density that communities will tolerate. Right, right. And that's why you get the skyscrapers, you know, I, they're not even sky. I'm from New York, so. <laughs> <laughs> you get the taller buildings downtown, you know, and that kind of thing. But, you know, people have a fit if you want to build a six-story building mm -hmm. at JP. Six stories is a joke, yeah. you know, when you're talking about your density. And I know it involves cost, but, you know, like, we got to get to 12. Right, right. You know, we got to get there. Glenn, you want to tackle that before you? We... Well, I'm probably the least qualified to talk about housing at this table, but maybe that's a good thing. I, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, my quick would be, um, you know, I, you know, there's a unique opportunity. I think and I, doing the urban farming stuff is actually less so now. When we first started this five, six years ago, you had a vacant lot, you know, on every every, you know, the white fence. You know where they're at. You just not, you see some pressure now in these neighborhoods, and you start to see gentrification happening. Just in Dudley, it's, it's amazing. But I do think that there's still an opportunity. There's, there's a land, there's, there's, there's land to be had to kind of make this stuff work. And I think, yeah, from an entrepreneurial point of view, it's about cost. I mean, affordability is the top issue, right? So, and I, I can anecdotally share that. Yeah, I, I have people texting me saying, "I can't live here anymore. I'm out. Half my staff had to move to Brockton, right? They just have to be able to afford it. And now they're commuting in every day. Um, so, how do you make it affordable? This is kind of your world. But I, you know, I think we have to deal with the union issue straight on. To be honest with you, and you know, the union sometimes has been the most diverse, right? So if we're talking about trying to create jobs in our community, can we think of alternative ways? Um, you know, prefab or some of, you know, some of this, I don't know, container houses. Can we bring stuff in to really bring your cost down, and and, and, and maybe have the developers less greedy and less percentage, so we can pass some of that back on to, uh, you know, to the owners. Uh, these are some of the things I'm thinking about. And the other thing I'm thinking about too is this thing around um, co-housing. I think there's a there's a there's a innate desire for folks to be with each other and be more in village and we're living isolated lives 
And I think there's a, also a benefit when you get intergenerational things going on. So you have your elder folks and you have new parents. And you know, so can we create unique things? Now, down the street from us is uh, the Lucy Stone Co-op. I don't know if folks know about it, but it's like you know, 10 people living in one of these old houses. They kind of eat you know, dinner every day. That's a little extreme for me, <laughs> let's be honest. But can you have more of a balance, more of a hybrid, where you have your private space that opens into your, uh, you know, your community space, where folks are living together, getting that benefit, but also bringing costs down and so on and so forth. So I think there's innovative ways out there to kind of do this, and I, I can't emphasize enough new energy, new leadership driven at that level. I think um, you know, if I was in charge. <laughs> but, it, but it's a little bit like uh, John's uh, E plus house program. Is there is there another city program uh, tied to Katie's story that might both look at a different way to regulate a project, but also might uh, look not at environmental questions, but social questions around um, a market, a, a, a housing type that everyone has a hunch would work, but nobody wants to be the first person to do it. But you do it as a home run, like the some balance co-housing thing. The waiting list is a million miles long, and then the market responds. So um, the, the idea that there's more a project like that one that uh, where government is useful in a way to 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 try things that, that maybe the market doesn't want to try. So let's move on to the next question. I don't know what time it is. You have a comment in the back if you're willing oh. to take it. Misha, how are you? Is there any kind of discussion? And I know this cannot be tackled in one day. It's kind of like a multi-tiered uh, problem. But what about housing for the homeless? Yeah, I, I think that's a really, I'm glad you mentioned it. And there is some good, the city's created thousands of units for the homeless. And what we're finding though, just recently, and I, and I would love to engage you in this conversation, is that the units that, were, that have been created, and with a lot of good work and a lot of resource, are not being targeted effectively to the folks on the street or the most in need. So we've got to do a better job targeting and we're kind of putting together based on data. Now once again, a better system of making those matches based on work in Houston and LA and various places are really getting much better about matching. So I'd, I'd love, I would love to catch up with you on that. Yeah, I, I, would, I would love to, can I answer that? Um, can I take on that question or did you want to respond to that? Okay, I just want to say, can I say a few things around homelessness? I mean. We've been working quite a lot. We work deeply in Skid Row. We work with Skid Row Housing Trust. Um, one of my Design for Equity partners um, has was a Rose Fellow there and now has continued on and is not only influential in the building design, but is also leading actually a community planning process called Our Skid Row. Because Skid Row is right in the center of downtown LA. And when you go there now, they're like dog walking services, which we all know what that means, right, next door. So it's really interesting, actually, while they're providing housing for chronically homeless, they're also f being pressured by this kind of gentrification and actually trying to give sort of community pride to this place. And Skid Row Housing Trust in particular has really used design and design excellence as a, as a real strategy what they found, and the project I showed earlier um, with the uh, Tenderloin Neighborhood Development Corporation and uh, community housing partners in San Francisco, is that design is critical to making the difference in fundamentally changing a person's trajectory. That you can't put them in a unit that is crappy or in a building that's crappy. That in fact, if you really want to change somebody's lives, you have to make that unit, you know, ennoble them, make them fight to keep it, do whatever it takes to sort of be able to stay. And um, that Richardson apartment, um, that corporation has like a 98% success rate. And they serve only chronically homeless. Um, they also, some of the numbers for that is that the city of San Francisco, five major cities, have found that they save $26,200 on average per person per year by housing somebody homeless. And those kinds of numbers that start to really add up. So it's fiscally responsible, but it also has to be done well. So moving on to the next question, although uh, Katie kind of answered it with her uh, answer to the homeless question. Um, because we're at the BSA today, uh, what role does design actually play in these issues? I, I know, uh, you know, I think Glenn made an excellent point, and, and Katie, you did too, with a design background, that 
maybe there's been too much looking at this question through the traditional disciplines of planning and design. Um, but it's not actually quite true in Boston relative to where the discussion, you know, uh, I, I was telling some people yesterday that, that if this conference was happening five years ago, it would have been held at the Kennedy School and not at the BSA. So I, I wonder if others want to tackle the question of design um, and how we might, on the BSA side or APA and the other kind of allied, you know, the landscape architects might <coughs> play a better role being involved with the whole housing question. A, a comment on that, just um, when I was in Philly recently, uh, my friend was kind of showing me some of the models and a, a, a small development team put together these kind of affordable houses. And what I read, what I learned was that it was like this kind of box form, you know, kind of, you know, and, and that cuts your cost down around your soft costs apparently. Mm -hmm. And I guess when I listen, I'm thinking, if we're going to try to really ish deal with this affordability issue, there has to be kind of a neighborhood educational side of the equation, right? Can we really go in and, and, and create some of these affordable housing, and they may have to look differently from the conventional? So I just, just it, I think it's a part of that design question, right. but I just, it's been on my mind lately because everyone, like you said, everyone, everyone's a part of this kind of conversation, this process, and if we're really in this together, you, you may not get the housing that look that you're used to looking, you know, right. at, over, over the decades. Meet other goals, right? Yeah. I want to <clears throat> echo something Katie said, which is I, I absolutely believe it's critical that in any solution for housing at affordable levels, it has to be done well. I mean, to build more housing but make it be someplace nobody wants to live doesn't do us any good. Um, you know, people have needs and they have wants, and if you're buried with trying to fulfill your needs, you don't get a chance to, you know, even think about your wants. And if you're fulfilling your needs in a place that you know is, is inadequate, you never kind of have the opportunity to think about what you want. Mm -hmm. You're never living, you know, a, a fruitful life or a life that you really want. Um, and so that kind of has to be a fundamental part of you know what we do. And so design, you know, there's all kinds of things that people have looked at in the past or are looking at now or talking about for the future, and that has to continue. I mean, innovation and design. Um, innovation kind of across all the spectrums, not just in design, the way we build them. You mentioned prefabricated uh, construction or modular construction. You know, people have been talking about that for 20 years. Um, and we, to a large extent, haven't really perfected that in a good way to deliver that. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about like the, the unions. And I, I think the unions need to be part brought in, and I think they're part of the solution. I think expanding their workforce, both from a diversity perspective and also just the supply. Um, they can be leaders in helping to make a real kind of prefabrication or modular approach work. And you know, instead of fighting, let's figure, let's have bring them in and have them be right. a partner in it. Right. And it can be the training ground for that workforce that we want to expand. Right. Can I put um, you on the spot though for a minute? Are there things right now that you would say that from a design point of view that, that we need to be looking at right now? Well, I think that's one. Um, and that's maybe less, well, it has implications for design, right? right? But right. It, modular it's, more about, it's more about right. kind of how you do it than, than, than how you design it. Um, I think that, um, you know, somebody mentioned earlier micro housing. Um, that's been a, a big topic of, you know, the last five, 10 years. Yeah. Um, and I think that there is um, kind of clear examples of that product that's been done really well and been very successful. And there's clearly a demand for it. Uh, I think the, the sources of that demand maybe vary from, you know, in, in some ways we want to provide that kind of housing as a solution to affordability. And in some cases, you know, there's just so much demand within the cities from so many millennials, somebody mentioned, um, that it kind of obscures the whole affordability kind of aspect of it. Mm -hmm. right? The market is just so tight and there's so much demand for it, you know, this is going to drive up the cost anyways. Right. Um, I think the, the other aspect of design, um, which is, I think is important and gets left out of these discussions often is, a, is an issue that Crystal raised about um, designing the fit of higher density projects in existing neighborhoods. And so, you know, how do you, um, the sweet spot now is a 70 foot tall, just under high rise, jam in five floors, you know. Uh, you know squeeze the floor heights. Squeeze the floor heights. All and and that, that makes the projects affordable. But, but how, what design strategies are required to make those look like they fit next to triple deckers. And that, that's, a, that's a design problem, it's also a site selection problem. It'll get back to land use and zoning. But I, I think there are also urban design questions that 
maybe are more impactful on housing supply even than. But it gets back to Glenn's point. It's like there's a whole community education, education piece, piece right. that right. has to happen, and it gets back to public leadership. It's like if we're if this is the goal, then the public has to be, you know, the one who goes out and explains to people that this is the goal, and where we can't meet that goal, you know, continuing to build triple deckers that fit into the right. existing sort of way that the, the neighborhood looks. Another aspect of that kind of the role of design to solve some of the problems that come from trying to solve density is not just about how many more units can we squeeze in and what does it look like from the outside, but really how does that building, even though it's more dense, interact <coughs> with the neighborhood? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, how That's does like, the right. building mm -hmm. represent and foster a community for the people that are inside? And how are they connected to everything around them? Yeah. You know, let's let's put more density in. Let's go from six stories to twelve stories, and let's put uh, one of Glenn's farms on the roof. Right. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there are three. There are sort of three major areas. The first is certainly like the innovation on the technology. People are doing this stuff. We just built uh, one of these homeless uh, buildings in on Skid Row with 101 uh, modular units. Mm -hmm perfect for micro unit or for homeless worked out they're tricky worked out it's complicated we can talk about it later but um, that piece is happening I think on this sort of sustainability front um, we have affordable housing projects now who are going for lead platinum and who are going for something called the living building challenge which is sort of uber lead where you're going for net zero water net zero energy and um, you know all of the materials in the building are healthy. It's complicated stuff, but the technology is really catching up, and we're seeing examples. I was just in Minneapolis, of all places, where they're going to have a net zero energy building. It's a harsh climate, and they can do it. You, we can do it. Um, but I think this this last point of like, what do we expect from these investments? In some of these, in some neighborhoods. The investment of a new affordable housing building of millions of dollars is the biggest investment that that neighborhood is going to have. You know, it's the biggest sort of investment of money in that neighborhood. So what are we expecting of our buildings? And I think the idea that we have to shift the thinking of design away from, um, I'm here to design a building. No, you're here to design an outcome, an experience. Um, I'll, I'll let Michael speak, but I'm going to tell one story actually about Mass Design. Um, I'm, we get to be roommates with Mass Design Group. Just one sh story, though, Katie. Okay, one story. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. You want me to stop talking no, no, now? No, no, one story. Okay, my story. My my quick story is that you know, Michael saw uh, Paul Farmer from Partners in Health talk about um, about building healthcare facilities. Um, in Africa and one of the primary challenges was that more people died of going to the hospital from airborne diseases and other causes of being in the hospital than from the cause that brought them there in the first place. So the question is not how do we design a hospital that will sort of facilitate this health care provision but rather how do we design a building that will make people healthier this is what we need to be demanding of our healthcare facilities, and it's what we need to be, be demanding of whether it's how do we design housing that will make people happier, how do we design transportation that will make people more connected, how do we design jobs that will make people smarter and more efficient. But who's in charge of balancing cost with mission? <coughs> No, I think everyone is. I, I, that, no, I, I would it's, say that it's, it, it, it has to be everyone. Otherwise, it has to be shared. Otherwise, right. you define end up. cost, Tim. What's your what's well, your I, mean, I, I, I think that uh, what what's clear, you know, now um, projects are reviewed reactively, right? There isn't like back to your scorecard. There isn't. Um, uh, there isn't a clear set of expectations for the market. Let's just talk about the market for now, not, not affordable. Affordable. Um, if, if 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 through the plan there was a clear template about what our expectations were, um, both as a set of principles that might be soft, some principles that might require metrics and proof, and um, a clear set of priorities about how the city or the BCDC 
who's going to review your project, that would go a long way, which is we don't want to see your building, a rendering of your building in isolation. You know, we, we want this kind of plan connected to the neighborhood. We, we only want this evidence of what your building does would go a long way in setting the priorities because the market at the end of the day just wants to know what the priorities are too. So I think channeling the expectation that the market would like to know more clearly what the city is prioritizing will is one solution maybe. Does that make sense, Sheila? Why I like, I, I, actually the chart is my takeaway today. Your, your chart about all the things you're trying to accomplish. So you're, you're not just trying to accomplish additional housing to house more people. You had start asking the questions early on, what are you trying to accomplish with this development? So that's, I think that's, that's a really good idea. Really good idea. So you start doing that early on because what I was, what I was gonna say is, when you go out and we do community processes and we do them all the time, every night, people wanna see what's familiar. So I think if we're going to change the conversation, we have to start with what are we trying to accomplish with this particular development lot, you know, uh, resource. And, and so if we start having a more complicated conversation with the community. <laughs> but also, not just, but not just that, but to put that building in the context of the future. Right. Right? right. So it's not just right. what we're trying to accomplish with this building, right. but what we're trying to accomplish right. with this plan, right? This right. this is part of a longer term plan. It's not about just what you're used to seeing, but the whole thing is gonna right. change before you and you need to be a part of that. But right. Glenn's suggestion too that there's an education That's piece what even I'm before saying. the project yeah. shows yeah. up. I would use that and I think I mean it, it, so there's a there's a role for vision, right? So the visionary side of the uh, Ted had mentioned earlier, out of the box. You mentioned disruptive. I mean, look, we have to, we have some shit going on. We have to really change our way of how we kind of live and so on, so how we use energy and so on. So, on. so what's the vision that we're, you know, we're trying to achieve? But I actually think, to your point around cost, I mean, innovation typically is subsidized. I mean, let's just be honest, right? right? Mm -hmm. So you have to subsidize this thing until we can get the scale. If we have a, a very clear vision where we want to go, and it involves unions, so and so forth, and we have to create about how we talk about prefabbing and so on and so forth. You create that path, and, and all of a sudden you start getting on that on that on that train, and you actually get to the you know the reality of it. So, so as we go forth and, and try new ideas and try and call for design and call for a more complicated or, or thorough discussion about what we want to see, I, I just go back to and I, I don't have an answer. As we do these sort of one-offs and try these new things, how do we if if something really starts to work, how do we? How do we have the larger development community adopt going forward? Because it's gonna, we're gonna end up with four, that's four great homes and two over there, and maybe the multifamily if it gets out of its lawsuit. But how do we start really seeing some best practices? Okay, so that, I think that's it. And thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Judges were not supposed to respond uh, to these kind, this kind of criticism. No one responded on your behalf. Um, the, there is no spokesman of the court who responded to the judges. No, 